What's up everybody, know there's been a long wait on this video, saw a few comments on the previous one asking where it is and I didn't want to leave people on an eternal cliffhanger, so here we go. This is what we're going to be building within this episode. You can see that we're using collision detection to determine when these particles collide and then we have some code that says what they should do when they collide. And in this case, that is bounce off of each other. We're also going to be adding a bit of interactivity to this to make sure that we have something that's interesting and fun to play with. You'll see that whenever I move my mouse over here, we're actually filling in the particles with their outside color, which is a pretty cool, nifty effect. So, getting this to work is a little trickier than you may think. So let's get right on to some core concepts and learn how to achieve this effect. Now we know how to detect the collision of just two objects, but the question remains, how do we react to these collisions? Well, there's a multitude of possibilities, but one of the most interesting and straightforward things we can do is have these objects bounce off of each other in a realistic manner. Learning how to do this will better your understanding of simulating physics effects within code and can be used towards production of games and interactive web art. So what is the process behind achieving this effect? Well, first we must ensure that whatever objects we spawn, that they're not being spawned on top of each other. If two objects are overlapping within our simulation, they're not going to be able to move since our collision detection code will assume that they're constantly colliding. Second, for each particle we must calculate the distance apart from themselves and every other particle on the canvas. We want to make sure our particles know that they should collide with every other particle on the screen, so we need to create some sort of way to monitor this. Third, once we're able to determine when these particles have collided, we need to have them react in a realistic manner. To do so, we're going to be using some utility functions that give us a realistic bounce effect, and this is more than just swapping the particle's x and y velocities on collision. We actually have to use some complex math that determines the exact angle the particles have collided and how the particles should react accordingly. Finally, we'll add some code for interactivity, and with that complete, we'll have a wicked canvas piece with particles bouncing off of each other in a realistic manner. So let's head on over to our text editors and let's get started. Alright, welcome everybody. So let's go ahead and get started on creating this canvas project. So to create a canvas project, I use an Alfred command that I created not too long ago to go ahead and spin everything up that I need to get started with canvas development. So all I have to do is type nk canv and then the name of the project. So I'm going to say this is collisions-7. Then I'm going to hit enter and this is going to go ahead and run all the terminal commands I need. It's going to open things up in my text editor and then finally it's going to open up this project within an actual browser window. And this is just a nice way to automate the process of getting all this set up. I just like getting things started really quickly, which is why I use this. And if you would like to learn how to do this yourself, I do have a tutorial in a blog post, which will show you how to get things set up. Uh, the blog post is dedicated towards 3JS, so getting a 3JS scene set up really quickly like you see right here. But you should be able to alter things just with Canvas and the Canvas boilerplate I created on GitHub to get things up and running with this. All right, so you'll see that over here in our browser window, we have our HTML canvas being read because we have this text on our mouse. And if we look within our source directory, we have all of our canvas code. So let's go ahead and get started with actually getting some particles on the screen. To get some particles on the screen, we're going to head down to our object blueprint right here. We're going to change this object to particle. And this particle has an X and Y coordinate, a radius and a color and we're drawing this particle each time we call this update function. This update function, this is where we're actually going to be moving all of our individual particles properties. So now that we have a blueprint for a particle, let's go ahead and start creating some on our canvas over here. We're going to create them within this init function, so we're going to say instead of using objects, we want a place to store all of our particles. And we're going to store all of our particles within an array, like so. All right, so now that we have a place to store our particles, we now actually need to push particles into our array so we can then draw them on our screen. So what we're going to do is for 400 times, we are going to push new particles into our particles array by saying new particle. And the arguments for this particle are up here. So it takes an x, y, radius, and color. And we want to make sure that our particles are being spawned randomly on the screen. So the first thing we're going to do is say const x is equal to math.random times our screen's inner width. And this is going to give us a random coordinate anywhere from 0 to the width of our screen. And then we want to do the same thing for our y coordinate. So we're going to say math.random times instead of inner width, we are going to say inner height. And then finally, we need a radius. So we'll say radius is equal to 10, just to get started. 
And then we need, I forgot, we need a color as well. So we'll say color is equal to blue just to start things out. And now that we actually have all of these created, we can pass them through into our particle constructor. And we should get some particles being placed within our particles array. So we'll say x, y, radius, and color. Save that, and then when we console log out our particles, we should see 400 particles in there. All right, so I'm going to open up our console. And you'll see we now have 400 particles, each with their own individual x and y coordinate that is being randomly generated right here. So we're not actually seeing anything on the screen just yet, and that's because we need to actually render these particles. We created them, but now we need to actually draw them on the screen. And we can do that by heading on over to our animate loop, and we are going to call particles, particles, <laughs> particles, and for each particle, we want to select our particle, and for each particle, we want to call that particles update function. All right, so we're going to go ahead and delete this fill text property right here. And if we call that, you'll see that now we're calling update for each of our individual particles within our array. And update will go ahead and return call this draw function, which draws it on the screen. So we have particles being drawn on the screen, but in order to create that collision detection between all these individual particles, we need to make sure that these particles are not being spawned on top of each other. Why? Well, if they're spawned on top of each other, our code is going to list them as always colliding, which means they're going to be stuck together and they're not going to get a realistic bounce effect. So to better illustrate this concept, instead of using a fill style, we're going to use a stroke style and we are going to call stroke instead of fill. So once we save this, you'll see that we have tons of different overlapping particles right here. So let's go ahead and fix that. Let's make sure that our particles are not being spawned on top of each other. So to fix this, we're going to go down to our init function right here. And instead of generating 400 particles, let's just focus on, let's just focus on a few. Let's focus on about four of them right now. So we have four particles and let's make them a lot bigger. Let's make them, yeah, okay, that looks pretty good to me. So we wanna make sure that these particles are never overlapping on top of each other. Well, what do we do to fix that? Well, here's the idea. Within this for loop, we are generating random X and Y coordinates for each of these individual particles. So we go through this once, we create a new x and y coordinate, and we push a new particle into our particles array. Well, the second time we go through it, we create a new x and y coordinate. And if that x and y coordinate is within a certain distance of the coordinate before it, the one that's already within this particle array, well, we need to regenerate this x and y coordinate so that it's placed somewhere else on the screen. So we, need, we know that we only want to do this for the coordinates that come after our initial particle because if we only spawn one particle on the screen, well, there's, nothing, there's no other particle to compare it against. So we need to make sure that we have at least two particles on the screen, and then we need to start comparing the particles' distances between each other to make sure that they're not less than zero. And if they are less than zero, we're going to regenerate them, place them somewhere else on the screen. So let's go ahead and do that now. First thing we're going to do is we're going to say if i is not equal to zero. So this is going to skip over the regeneration process for the first iteration because we only have one on the screen but for all of our other particles we're going to loop through all of our particles so particles.length and we're going to be using j instead of i because we want to make sure that these two are different so we're looping through all of the particles that already exist so for all the particles that already exist compare their location to the randomly generated location that we have here within our x and y coordinates. So to do this, we're going to be using that utility function we created within the last episode. Um, I, I changed it up a bit, I'm calling it distance here, and it takes an x and a y coordinate and another x and y coordinate. So we're going to be comparing the distance between this coordinate and this coordinate right here within this for loop. So what we can say is if the distance between x and y are randomly generated coordinates, and the distance between the particles that have already been created, so particles j dot x, and particles j dot y. If the distance between these two is less than zero, and now remember, we need to take into account that these circles have radii associated with them. So to take that into account, we want to make sure we're saying radius times two minus radius times two, sorry. 
So we're saying if the distance between these two is less than zero, if they're overlapping, then we want to regenerate our x and our y coordinates. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this, paste it with our if statement, and let me go ahead and full screen this so you can see it a little better. Get rid of the constants. We don't really need those right now. So we already declared things up here. And since constants make sure that your variables cannot change later on, we want to make sure that we change these to let because we might be changing them later on within this for loop if required, if they're overlapping. All right, so once we do that, we now have a way to randomly regenerate the coordinates in case the particles are overlapping. Well, you'll see that we still have some overlap here. And the reasoning for that is even though we regenerate some new coordinates, these newly generated coordinates might be overlapping on top of particles anyways. So what we need to do is once we generate these new ones, we need to restart our loop all over again to make sure that these coordinates are not equal to whatever particles already exist on the screen. So to restart our loop over again, we're going to be setting J right here. We're going to be setting it equal to negative 1. And we're not setting this equal to 0 like we are right here because remember, once we go through this for loop, we're adding 1 onto it, which means we're starting off at 1 rather than 0 like we want. So we're setting it to negative 1, and that is going to make sure that things should not spawn on top of each other. So you'll see that they are still spawning on top of each other. Let's go ahead and do some quick debugging to figure out what is going on here. And if we look closely within our for loop, you'll see that I forgot to change this i to j, which is probably the issue. Let's go ahead and console log things out. See what we get going here. It says cannot read property x of undefined. So this is on line 97. All right, so the, the issue was me being dumb within our console statement. So no worries. It looks like our code was working all along as soon as we changed this from i to j. So let's go ahead and save that. Check things out in our browser. And now each time we save the page, you'll see that our particles are being randomly generated, but they are never being spawned on top of each other because we have this catch statement that basically says, if these particles are being spawned on top of each other, just put it in a new location until it's somewhere that's free. And that's basically what we're doing right here. So each time I save this, you'll notice that these particles are never being spawned on top of each other. And that is the first step to creating this realistic collision detection effect. So while we're at it, let's make sure that these particles are always spawned within the boundaries of our canvas as well. You'll see that they're overlapping on both the top and the bottom coordinates of our canvas. And if we do this enough times, you'll see that they're overlapping on the left and right hand side. And that is due to this right here. So we're, we are saying that this particle can be spawned anywhere from zero to our full canvas width and zero to our full <laughs> canvas height. But really, we want to make sure that it can only spawn from our circle's radius to the canvas width minus the radius. All right, so that might be a little confusing. Let's go ahead and actually put it in code so it can make more sense. So we're getting a random value here, but we're actually going to be using this utility function, random int from range, to give us a random integer to spawn these. So we want to spawn these anywhere from our circle's radius, so 100, to the canvas width minus the radius. And that's going to make sure that these are never overlapping with the left and right hand sides of our screen. So since we're using radius in this, let's go ahead and push radius up to the top of this. And even though we, we just added this line of code, you'll see, well, we're still getting overlap. Well, why is that? Well, since we are changing this here and we're regenerating things in case particles are overlapping, we aren't running this check here that makes sure that they're being spawned within the canvas's boundary. So we want to replace X with this new random generate function like so. And now if we do things, you'll see that they're never going to be spawned on the left and right hand sides of the screen. So I'm actually going to decrease the radius a little bit. Just make sure we don't run into any issues with these trying to spawn somewhere and not being able to. Um, we're going to do the same thing with our Y coordinate. So we're going to just copy and paste this right here. But instead of referencing our canvas's width, we are going to say spawn it anywhere from a circle's radius, so about right here, to our canvas's height minus the radius, which is about right here. So we're going to take this, Put it within our Y, and if we save that, now we have particles generated within our screen, always within the canvas's boundaries, but never overlapping with on the other particles. So this is step one. We finished step one completely, we have everything we need to do. But step two is we need a way to monitor the distance for each of these individual particles for all the other particles surrounding it. So let's use this one particle as a reference. I need a way to monitor the distance between this particle and this particle, the distance between this particle and this particle, 
and the distance between this particle and this particle. Then let's say I select this one right here. I need a way to monitor the distance between this particle and this one, this one, and this one, and then this one and this one. So we need a way to add collision detection for each of these individual particles, monitoring all of the particles around it. So how do we go about doing that? Well, to do so, we're going to head up to our update function, and we're actually going to be passing all of our already created particles through this function. So this particle right here represents one individual particle, but we need a way to compare its distance between all of the particles that already exist on the screen. So to do so, we're going to be passing our particles through as an argument. This is an ES6 way to pass an argument through a function. So we're getting all of our particles, and then we're going to be doing collision detection between this individual particle to all the other particles out there. So we're going to say for all of our particles that exist, particles.length, we are going to get the distance between the particles and this particle. But since we're passing all of our particles through into this blueprint, including this particle itself, we want to make sure we're only doing collision detection between this particle and the one surrounding it. We don't want to do collision detection between this particle and itself. So to get around this, we're going to say if this is equal to particles i. So if the particle is equal to itself, we are going to skip over this for loop by running continue. This is going to make sure we're never comparing a particle to itself, which is cool. Uh, but really, we want to do collision detection between all of the other particles, which we shall do. So to do collision detection between all of the other particles, we're going to do the same thing that we did down here for collision detection. We're going to grab this if statement, bring it on up here, paste it in. Let me full screen this, make it a little easier for you guys to read. And we're going to be grabbing the distance not between an x and a y variable, but this dot x, this dot y, and then this particle's for loop uses an i instead of a j, so we're going to swap that out. So essentially, each time we run through this loop, we're going to be getting the distance between this particle and all of the surrounding particles as signified right here. And if this dot radius times 2, since all our radii are the same, this is going to determine whether or not these particles are colliding with each other. So if they are colliding, let's console log out a statement that says has collided. And I'm going to, I believe that is how you spell it. I might have murdered that. Um, all right, so let's see what's going on here. We have an error that says property length cannot be defined. And that's because we are passing particles through here within our blueprint, but we are not actually passing all of our already created particles that we created within this init function. We are not passing through our array into our update function like we want to. We need to make sure we're actually pushing these particles into our function like so. We already created them. We're just pushing them through now within our update function. So we save things, let's do a hard refresh, get rid of these console errors. And now you see we have no errors, which is awesome. But really, these aren't even moving, so there's no way for us to actually tell whether or not they have collided. So things are kind of boring right now. Let's get these particles moving, and then once they touch, we should be seeing this console.log statement. To get these particles moving, we are going to be adding another property up top called this velocity. And this is going to be equal to an object with an x and a y velocity. So we want to make sure that these particles can go in any direction, up, down, left, or right. And in order to achieve that, we're going to be using math.random, which gives us a random number anywhere from 0 to 1. And we're going to be subtracting 0 0.5 from it. And what this does is it'll go ahead and give us any random value from negative 0.5 to 0.5. And we're going to do the same thing for our y coordinate, make sure that it can move in any direction. And we should be good to go there. But now we need to actually add this velocity onto our x and y coordinates. So in order to do that, right beneath our collision detection check right here, we're going to be saying this dot x plus equal to this dot velocity x. And that's going to add our x velocity onto this current x coordinate, and then we're going to do the same thing for y. This dot velocity dot y. And once we save things, you'll now see that these particles are moving in random directions. And once they collide, collide, there we go. We have our collision detection being activated for all of our individual particles. You'll see once it moved off of it, it stopped colliding, or it stopped logging that has collided console statement. So let's go ahead and keep testing this out. Let's see if we can get multiple particles colliding with each other. There we go. And then these ones are going to collide as well, and it should amplify things a little bit, getting a lot faster. Perfect. 
Okay, so we have our collision detection here across all particles. One of the issues you'll see is these particles keep on drifting off the screen, which is not really what we want, especially when we look at the example over here. All the particles are bouncing off the individual boundaries of the screen. So this is really easy to fix. Let's go ahead and do that first before we actually get the other particles bouncing off of one another. To actually fix the issue with these particles going off the screen, we are going to be using an if statement that says, and we've done this in a few other tutorials, I believe, but nevertheless, we are going to be saying if this.x minus this.radius is less than or equal to zero, which means if the circle and its radius is touching this side of the screen, then we want to reverse the x velocity. And we are going to be doing the same thing if the circle is touching this side of the screen. So we want to say if this.x plus this dot radius is greater than or equal to the inner width of our screen, we are going to reverse this dot velocity dot x. Let's test that out real quick. See if we can get them hitting the sides of our screen. Okay, and it looks like I forgot to actually switch this velocity. I'm going to full screen things real quick just so I can better see the code. It's kind of hard to see when I have uh, both the browser window and the text editor open at the same time. But once this hits the side of the screen, whether it be the left or the right, we want to reverse the velocity here. So we're going to say this dot velocity dot x is negative. And once we save that, we should get the bouncing off the left and the right hand side. I'll keep refreshing until we get something close. And there we go, it bounces off the left hand or <laughs> the right hand side of the screen. But we really want to do this for both not only the left and right, also the top and bottom parts of the screen. So what we can do here is we can just copy and paste this if statement that we just created. Instead of referencing the x values, we're going to replace them with y. And instead of using the inner width, we are going to be using the inner height of our canvas. So once we do that, we should get bouncing off both the top, bottom, left, and right hand sides of our screen. And we do. Okay, perfect. So now we actually want these particles to jump off of each other. How do we go about doing that? While this is actually quite a complicated process, there's a lot of math and physics that goes into this, and it can be quite, quite complicated to actually wrap your head around. I know it took me quite a long time to even get a good gist of how this thing works from a high level standpoint. So we're going to go over things from a high level standpoint, get things working right off the bat, and then I'll do my best to explain things uh, in regards to how this collision detection and reaction is actually working. So I'm going to be copying in some utility functions, which you can copy in as well. There is a, gist, a GitHub gist in the description of the video, which has these. And let's go ahead and check things out. So I've copied in two functions. We have a rotate function and we have a resolve collision function. So if I go ahead and take this resolve collision function and I go to the spot where our particles are colliding, paste it in there, you'll see that our resolve collision function takes two particles, both objects, if I go ahead and push one particle in here, this particle itself, and then the particle we are comparing the collision detection against, the particle's eye, then that should be all we need to get that realistic effect. So let's go ahead and save things and see what we get. All right. All right, so you see when they touch, they actually just disappear. And you'll see the reasoning for that is because this resolve collision function uses mass within it. We actually haven't declared anything for our particle's mass, so let's go ahead and do that now. We're going to give our particle, all of our particles, a mass of one. And you can toy around with this afterwards, but for the sake of this tutorial, let's just go ahead and keep things at one. If I go ahead and save this, head back on over here, you'll see that's all we need for realistic collision detection and reaction. This is what we call an elastic collision. So elastic collisions mean that when these particles collide, no energy is lost to any external forces. So the energy is completely maintained across all of the circles all the particles traveling across the screen. So how does this function actually work? It's really easy to paste in there, but what are some of the details behind it? Well, if we look at some of the details, I'm going to full screen this again. You need to understand things from a high level standpoint. How does this function actually work? What is the process behind creating that realistic reaction, that elastic collision? Well, it's really, it, it is quite complicated to understand. And I actually drew up some diagrams, which I think will help us understand it better. So let's go ahead and bring one of those diagrams over here. I created it in Photoshop. And you'll see that we have two circles colliding with each other here. We have a blue circle coming from the left to the right, and we have a red circle coming from the right to the left. Well, in order to create an accurate reaction to these two circles colliding, what variable do we actually need to change between these two circles? 
really, it's velocity. So we need to change this circle's velocity and this circle's velocity based on the angle they hit at right here. And in order to do so, we need to follow a specific algorithm. And that algorithm consists of a few things. So the first thing I want to go over is equation we're going to use to swap out these two circles' velocities with new ones that are going to give an accurate representation of how these two circles collided. So that equation is over here, and it's called the one-dimensional Newtonian equation. I believe that is what it's called. Uh, so there's a lot of math here, and it can get really confusing, but really, what we want to happen is we want to call this function right here on our separate velocities, but we can only call this function if these two particles right here, these two circles, are traveling within one dimension. So you'll see right now we have two dimensions. We have an x dimension and we have a y dimension. I believe that is the correct terminology for it. Um, but this, this equation that we have that I just showed you, the one dimensional Newtonian, it only works if we're traveling in one dimension. So that means our circles have to be parallel to each other and traveling from left to right, right to left, only across the x-axis. So you can see that this equation right here will work if these two circles are only traveling left to right. Once we get things in two dimensions, that equation isn't going to work. We actually have to do a little bit of extra math. And what we have to do is we have to rotate things by this angle right here, the angle created by the collision between the two objects. So drawing a right triangle, we get an angle, but then we need to actually rotate things by the angle. So if we rotate things like so, we can now run that one dimensional equation on these two circles based on their velocities. So once we run that equation, we're going to get the new velocities for them. But then we need to translate things back by re-rotating things back to their original positioning, like so. And I believe that is zero. So that is essentially the gist behind creating this realistic reaction. So let's go ahead and look at the code real quick and see if we can draw some parallels between the code and the diagram and the equation that we just went over. So starting off, the first thing we need to do is prevent any accidental overlap of particles. So this is grabbing the difference in velocity and distance on both the x and y components of the two particles that we're passing through. And if this is equal to zero, this is the only time we're actually going to react to the collision. If we don't have this here, we get a lot of room for error. We have an effect that might occur in which the particles actually connect to each other, stick to each other, and don't bounce. So we need to make sure that we have this to prevent any accidental overlap. Second, we are grabbing the angle between our two colliding particles, so particle and other particle. And if we look at our model over here, you'll see that we have two colliding particles, and this is the angle that's created between the two. So based on the x and y positioning of this particle and the x and y positioning of this particle, we can grab the angle by using this function right here, arctangent 2. So we're grabbing the angle, and then we're rotating our particle's velocities. We're rotating the coordinate system by that angle. So when we run this right here, rotate, we're rotating our coordinate system like so. So now we have things on one dimension. We can use that one dimensional collision equation. And that is what we're doing next. We're running that complete equation that you saw in Wikipedia. Let's bring that up. You'll see that we have the initial velocity right here, which is u. We have the mass minus the other mass, and then we have a few more extra things in order to get an accurate representation of the collision. You can see this matches up directly with what we have right here. And we're doing this only for the x coordinate. We don't need to do this for the y because we are only using things on the x axis. So finally, we are going to rotate things backwards once we get a result for that. So back to our original coordinate system, like so. And you can see we're doing that right here. We're just reversing the angle in which we rotated things by. And finally, we are swapping our particle's velocities with the new velocities that we just attained by running things through our one dimensional collision equation. And with all of that, that is how we produce the effect of all these particles bouncing off of each other. So that's the general gist of how this equation works from a high level standpoint. Like I said, we can get into this a lot more detailed. If that's something you guys are interested in, please let me know and I might be able to write a blog post on it. But really that should give you enough to be dangerous with this equation and get your particles moving and bouncing realistically off of each other. So we're not done just yet. If we look at the example, you can see that we had a few more things. Let me go ahead and pull that up real quick. Our particles are bouncing off of each other, but they're moving at different speeds, they're different sizes, and they're different colors. And we also have this effect where if we hover our mouse over the particles, well, the particles are changing their opacity, or at least the fill opacity. So let's go ahead and get, let's just go ahead and start things off with getting them the right size, getting them moving at a quicker speed, and also getting them colored. And then we'll go ahead and add the interactivity. So to go ahead and add more particles to this, we're going to head down to init. 
And rather than four particles, let's just say we want to add 100. And we need to make sure we're changing the radius to this if we are, have these all spawn on the screen accurately without getting stuck in a constant loop. So we're going to say radius of 15. And now we have all of our particles on the screen, which is cool. But now we want to be able to change the actual speed in which these particles are moving. So we're going to head back on up to velocity and get a random value anywhere from negative 5. Actually, I believe this is a random value from negative 2.5 to 2.5. I believe that is correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. Essentially, this is going to increase our velocities in which our circles can be spawned at. And now we have something a lot more, a lot closer to what we saw within the example. All right, but right now everything is the same color. Changing the color of these to get them something random is really easy. I have a utility function called random color. And this just takes an array of colors, which we have up here, and it's going to return to us a random color based on whatever colors we pass through. So if we scroll on down, You'll see our color is currently hard-coded to blue. We want a random color from our colors array. And just like that, we now have colors all over the place. And there's a really light color in there, which I'm not really a huge fan of. I believe it is... Which color is it? I believe it's this one right here. I'm going to delete it. Yes, that was it. So now all of our particles are colored, which is nice. But now we need to add collision detection between our mouse and each of these individual particles. So just like we did with everything else. Let's go ahead and do that now. I'm going to full screen this again. And within this collision detection stuff with the wall boundaries, we're going to add mouse collision detection. We are going to say if the distance, so I'm going to grab this right here. If the distance between our mouse's x coordinate and our mouse's y coordinate and this coordinate's x and this coordinate's y is less than, let's just say 30. And well, let's console log things out. Let's just say console log collided. All right, cool. So we're going to see if this works. And each time we hover over one of these, we are now calling our console log of collided. So a really easy way to do collision detection between our mouse and each of the individual particles on the screen. But nothing's happening just yet with the background color of our particles. So what we want to do is we want to head on down here and create a fill for our particles. We're going to say c.fill. And before that, we are going to say c.fill style is equal to this dot color. And that's going to fill things in. Let's go ahead and look at it. You'll see all of our particles are now colored in. But we want to make sure that these particles have an opacity for their fill style, which only increases if we're hovering over them. So to do that, I'll full screen things again. There are a few ways to do this, including using RGBA values, but I think the easiest way is to stick with hexadecimal values and edit the global opacity of our canvas instead. So if we want to go ahead and change the opacity of our fill color, we can say something like c.global alpha is equal to 0 0.2. Save that, and that's going to change the opacity of our entire canvas to 0 0.2. And let's go ahead and check that out. You'll see everything is really light now. But the, the borders of our circles should be dark. So how do we solve this issue? To solve this issue, we are going to be calling something called c.save. And this is going to save the current state of our canvas at this specific point in time. And then after we call fill to fill in our circles, we are going to say c.restore. So what this is doing is we're saving our current state of our canvas. And then we are decreasing our alpha for just the fill to 0.2. And we know that we're just doing it for the fill because fill is contained within the save and restore function. But once we do that, only the fill for our background has a lighter opacity. But really, we want to add interaction. So when we move our mouse over this, we are getting this opacity increased over time. So rather than just hard code an opacity of 0.2, we are going to say this opacity should be equal to this dot opacity. So each individual particle is going to have its own individual property which controls how light it is on the screen. So we can say this dot opacity is going to start off at zero. So there shouldn't be a fill, which is perfect. But now we want to actually increase this when the distance of our mouse is hovered over one of these actual particles. So what we can do is we can say this dot opacity plus equal to 0 0.02, and that should get things filled up. You'll see now they're starting to fill up very slowly, I guess not that slow. But they're starting to fill up over time. And the issue here now is that whenever we hover off of them, they're not going back to their original state. And we might want to restrict the opacity in which these particles can actually go to. 
So let's go ahead and do that. Let's make sure they can only go to somewhat of a lighter value, but not all the way to full opaque. To restrict the opacity in which these particles can go to, we're going to be adding an and statement here. It says, only call this, only increase the opacity if this.opacity is less than or equal to, actually let's just do less than, is less than 0.2. That's going to restrict things, make sure that they can only go up to a light opacity, which you can see here, they're not filling in all the way, which is perfect. But now we want to make sure that they get lighter as our mouse hovers off of them. So we're going to add an else if that says if this dot opacity is greater than zero, then we want to subtract 0 0.02 from this opacity instead. So we go ahead and check things out now. See that we're getting a really, really weird bug. And the reasoning for this is when we are subtracting 0 0.02, we can log this out really quickly. We're going to be getting some values that don't really make sense. And this is some, an issue with the equation of subtracting floats from each other in JavaScript. So we want to make sure that our opacity can never go below zero. And to do that, we can say this dot opacity should never go below a value of zero or itself, this dot opacity. So this is going to contain things within a boundary of zero to point two. And once we do that, we should get rid of that bug with the circles filling in all the way, which we do. But you see, if we look at the example over here, we have a much larger radius in which we can hover over these circles to have them fill in. So let's go ahead and do that. All we have to do to increase the radius is increase this number right here. So let's go ahead and give it a radius of 80, which means whenever our mouse is within 80 pixels of a circle, it's going to fill in. And if we save that and look at our screen, you'll now see we have a much larger radius in which our mouse can get close to these circles and fill them in, but it's not perfect. So let's go ahead and say 120. So that's going to cover things up for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. We learned a lot about math, physics, and a lot about collision detection. If you would like to support me, go ahead and subscribe, leave a like, and share with your friends. Go ahead and donate to me over on Patreon if you would like. Um, every donation I get helps a ton. I can't tell you how much it really helps towards me being able to produce more of these videos. Otherwise, I hope you guys had a great day. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Stay tuned for next week. Peace.